Welcome to the Every Voice Now podcast, where we bring voices of color into the spotlight. In every episode, you'll hear stories of our authors of color, how God led them to write their books, and the challenges they had to overcome along the way. Hi, everyone. Helen Lee here, and I'm excited to introduce today's conversation with Daniel Yang, who, along with Eric Costanzo and Matthew Sorens, co-authored the 2022 IVP book, Inalienable, How Marginalized Kingdom Voices Can Help Save the American Church. Daniel is the director of the Church Multiplication Institute at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center, which is a think tank for evangelism and church planting. He himself is pastor and helped to plant many churches in the Detroit area, Dallas-Fort Worth, Toronto, and Chicago. And currently, he's getting his PhD in intercultural studies at the Trinity International University. I learned so much from Daniel in this interview as he shared his journey as a Hmong American and all the ways his heritage and experiences have influenced his writing. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And make sure to stick around until the end of the show to hear how you can get a special deal on this book. And now, on to today's show. Well, I am excited to welcome Daniel Yang to the Every Voice Now podcast today. So thanks so much for joining us, Daniel. Thanks for having me, Helen. Well, as we often do on our Every Voice Now podcast stories, we love to hear from our authors, particularly our authors of color with regards to their ethnic journeys. And so tell us all a little bit about your own ethnic background and maybe if you don't mind identifying some key moments in your own ethnic identity journey, that would be great to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And again, thanks for having me, Helen. I really appreciate the work that you do and IVP does for the broader church. Ethnically, I'm Hmong. And so the majority of Hmong people in the world would live in China. My parents were from Laos. Uh, we immigrated to the U.S. in 1979 as refugee immigrants by way of uh, Thailand. So my mom was six months pregnant with me when we landed here in the U.S. And, you know, Hmong people are an ethno-linguistic group. And so they're roughly, depending on how you count, between four to 10 million around the world. Uh, here in the U.S., about maybe 300,000. You know, the capital of Hmong land in the U.S. is probably the Twin Cities, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. And I grew up in inner city Detroit, although we landed here in the U.S., here in Illinois. uh, Most of my upbringing was Detroit. So if uh, any of your listeners, if you've seen the movie Gran Torino, that's like a depiction, Clint Eastwood's depiction of what it looked like to be Hmong people growing up in inner cities of Detroit. So that would have been uh, my neighborhood. Half of the people in that movie were from my church. And so, you know, it tries to get at some of the themes that Hmong people experienced when they came to the U.S. It's interesting because my own family story has not ex- exact parallel, but I'm the daughter of a North Korean refugee. So my dad fled from Pyongyang, right, at the beginning of the Korean conflict. And he did that when he was 13. And I've just heard so many stories of that part of his life and how it has shaped him. Do you feel like as you think about what that means for you as a second generation Hmong American, like how much has even those stories from your your parents and that time in their life when they had to go through such extreme situations, like how much do you feel like that's shaped your own ethnic understanding and identity? A lot, Helen. You know, I think I'm 42 now and I'm at the point in my life where I have like enough knowledge and information about part of this is I did a a very small video project with my dad just to understand the stories and the narratives that he and my mom went through. And so I realized that at least with my generation, second generation, and even though I'm American born, I have a lot of 1.5 sensibilities, that there is a sense where I the knowledge and the information of coming from essentially a war that experienced a country that experienced civil war, being an ethnic minority amongst that country as they were experiencing civil war, having to go through ethnic cleansing, you know, my parents and, and others, and then fighting alongside the American CIA. You know, for me, those big themes, so, you know, Lao nationalism, even, you know, being an ethnic minority Hmong person, the American presence in Southeast Asia, 
like these things shaped how I understood myself. But in the learning journey, I'm also realizing that the story of the Hmong precedes that, you know, and that that in itself also has impacted me. And then I think about my children who are, you know, both my wife and I are Hmong, but they also have agency to define what does it mean to be Hmong for themselves moving forward as well. And so the whole refugee experience shapes my experience completely. But I'm also like discovering like the larger story as well and learning how to uh, understand myself in the, in the bigger picture, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to know more about this video project you just referenced that you created with your dad. Is that something just for your own family story and legacy or is it something that others can potentially learn from and watch? Yeah, you know, hopefully, yes. I mean, definitely the first and then hopefully the, the latter. So the short story is about a year and a half ago, I had some health issues, I had heart surgery. And, you know, when you go through something like, it was a quadruple bypass, I was um, 41 uh, at the time. And when you go through something like that, you think about like your mortality, your limits, where do you come from? What do you want to leave for your children? My dad, who was 81 at the time, this last year or so, he's now 82, he came to stay with me at our house here in Chicagoland during my recovery. And it was a really sweet, nice thing for him, you know, at that age to just be, yeah, obviously he knew he couldn't help physically, but being present physically, he thought that that would mean something. And it did. And so I rented a camera and learned how to, you know, to shoot high quality video. And for three days, about six to eight hours uh, each day, he just sat in front of the camera. I asked him questions about our family history. I dug into what it felt like to, you know, how he met my mom and what it felt like to have a family and raise a family amid uh, the war, to be nomadic, to be in the refugee camps. What was it like to build a life here in America? And then probably you know, most importantly was uh, he lived his first half of his life as uh, someone who would identify more with like a shamanistic, animistic worldview, quasi-Buddhist, and at the age of 40, 41, became a follower of Jesus for the first time. And we unpacked like what that meant because he was the first believer in the history of our family, but also at the time he was also the only believer in our family. And uh, so we unpacked a lot of that. And so a lot of it was for you know our own records. Uh, a lot of it is also for our children. And I think it's a part of like this larger monograph of like Hmong people here in the United States. And I hope at one at some point it'll, it'll contribute to some archive that somebody's keeping somewhere. <laughs> yeah, this whole theme of sharing our stories, preserving our stories, especially passing them on to the next generation, I think is so significant. So it's wonderful that you were able to do that, you know, with your dad. Yeah, and. A part of that is also with the Hmong people, because for a long time, our written language and anything that we had written down was destroyed. So the Hmong are thought to have originated from central China, eventually moved to the southern provinces of China. And as the Qing dynasty began to kind of spread, a lot of the smaller minority groups, including the Hmong, were assimilated into those who weren't, they were pushed out into the hill tribes or into the mountains. And so the language system was destroyed. So everything was passed on orally for a long, long time or through story cloths. So there's a thing called, we call it bandao, but it's a Hmong story cloth, which actually records history and some of the culture passed down through the generations. And so it wasn't until like maybe 1950s where Catholic priests came into Southeast Asia and developed a writing system for the Hmong that the Hmong began to be able to record their own stories. And even then they used the Romanized alphabet. So in a lot of ways, like, you know, I'm kind of thinking as a second generation American and what stories do I want to hand off to my children? I think about the power of both video because they get to see who. I never got to meet my grandparents and I don't know what they look like, but they get to see and hear and then experience for generations, you know, who their grandparents and great grandparents will be. And I think that's a part of, again, their ability to answer the question, what does it mean to be Hmong moving forward and not just hold on to 
definitions that were, you know, that, that either I've created for myself or even my parents created for us. Yeah, I think it's so meaningful that we're talking about everything you just shared about Hmong writing and the disappearance of language. And now we're talking about all this in the context of you having contributed to writing a book. And so I'm curious to know, as you even talked about the fact that you've been a part of this book project, what kind of impact has that had on your parents and in your family, as you've discussed it? Just share a little bit about the reactions you've experienced from those in your family about the fact that you are a published author. You know, my mom is uh, with the Lord now. My dad, I think he's just really happy in the sense that I'm pursuing, you know, my field with intensity. And, you know, I think he celebrates with us in my acknowledgments. I made sure to first acknowledge him and my mom early on because they have the lowest education out of my entire family. And their faith was so simple. Like if you were to ask them, are they an evangelical? They wouldn't know what you're talking about. Like the term American Christianity just doesn't even translate into the Hmong language. So, but they taught me more about Jesus than any other people. And, you know, and they taught me more about what it means to be a, an American more than anyone else, you know, as immigrants that have became American citizens. And so, so they're very much a part of this writing project. I'd love to, for you to say more about that, about the fact that you, you just had your parents taught you more about what it means to be American than anyone else. Can you just talk about that a little bit more? It's a really intriguing statement that I'd love to hear more about. Yeah. You know, I mean, we all have heard some version that America is the land of immigrants, right? I mean, the Statue of Liberty, you know, you have Lady Liberty inviting the nations to send to her the oppressed and the tired and the hungry. And I'm like, that's exactly what my parents were when they landed here in the U.S. in 1979. They were settled through the Lutheran social services by a little Lutheran church in East Moline, Illinois. And they were, as best as you know, I can understand, trying to be Jesus to these newly arrived immigrants and loving them, not just in the name of Jesus, but also helping them to acclimate as new arrivals and new Americans. And my parents made a beautiful life for themselves, you know. I'm risking a little bit of like stereotype, and I'm kind of just saying this jokingly, but they, you know, I mean, they were, as an Asian family, they got a doctor in the family, they got a lawyer in the family, they got engineers in the family. And That without ever having an education. My dad, by the time he retired at age 65, made $13 an hour. And so I just think about like the potential of what America has been able to represent, you know, to the world. And my parents have definitely met those expectations and maybe have exceeded that. Because I don't think America is not, it's not just a land or an ideal, but it it is about like, a global community being able to be themselves in that, you know, that's part of what our book is trying to, you know, from a biblical, but also from, you know, a national perspective, like there are ideals that America has that we would like to hold America to because it's intrinsic to what makes America, America. Going back to even you becoming a published author, is that something that you dreamed about ever? Like when you were a kid growing up, did you think in your head, I want to do this? Or is it something that just kind of emerged over time in your adulthood? As a kid, I don't know if I would have ever thought that I would write a book. By the time I got to my grad studies, my first career was an engineer. And then when I felt a calling to vocational ministry, went to seminary. And probably, you know, in my late 20s, early 30s was when I started thinking, one day I'll write something. And then I read something by Tim Keller probably not too long after that, maybe mid-30s. And he said something to the effect that you don't write anything until you're 50 because you're going to not even believe what you wrote. (laughs) So that kind of haunted me for a little bit. But I, I began having aspirations in writing for two reasons. One, because writing was not a big part of our Hmong culture history. Again, I mean, our stories were passed down orally. They were passed down through story cloths. They were recounted. You know, they were maybe reenacted even in some of the Hmong cultural rites. And if you were a Christian, you lost a lot of those rites because those rites were attached to 
animistic and shamanistic worldviews. And so as a Christian, there were some things about our culture that we felt like we had lost as well. And so writing for me became a form of like ambition to contribute to a larger community of, you know, of what it meant to for Hmong people to be, be uh, to have progress. And then secondly is, I think that, you know, I, I was, I never thought that my first like writing project would have been like something about the Hmong. But at one point, I know that I'd like to contribute something that is socially located in who I am as a Hmong person. And so that's always been an ambition of mine. And I don't know if it's my second, my third, or my fifth writing project, Helen, but at some point, I feel like I want to write. And so that's always been a part of the ambition. But, in, you know, writing this book with Eric and Matt was a great kind of like introduction into it. Well, I look forward to the day when you get to publish that story um, from your Hmong cultural context. I think that we need more stories from your community. So I can't wait for that day. Well, let's talk a little bit about the project you did with Matthew Sorens and Eric Estando, because that's an interesting team writing experience that not many people get a chance to have. It's not easy, you know, even as a solo person to write a book. So I have to imagine that having three of you write a book together could be complicated. So tell me a little bit about the genesis of how you came to work together. Was it just fairly simple that you all decided to write together, more gradual? And then what was that actually like to try to team write this book together? Yeah, so Matt Sorens and I, we're we're friends. We're we're also, we live in the same city. And so he lives about 10 minutes away from me here in Aurora. He works for World Relief. uh, And he and Eric Costanzo, they had been talking about writing a similar book already. Eric had some thoughts outlined very early on, and it was really coming out of 2016, 17. For Matt, it was the changing sentiment around immigration and refugees from evangelicals that he found disturbing. And then Eric, as a pastor in the Midwest, close to the South, seeing the religious attitudes towards you know immigrants and others. So they were wanting to write a book that had more of a, you know, an impact on evangelicals and thinking better about, you know, uh, Christians from around the world. And uh, so Matt and I were talking about the project and he invited me into it. I was probably at a time where, you know, work was really busy for me and, but I did want to begin writing something. And I think a part of it was also my work as a missiologist. It was a a little bit of a different perspective. You know, Matt works in advocacy with World Relief and then Eric being a local church pastor. And so the kind of missiologist, you know, slash quasi-theologian perspective was one that they wanted to bring in as well. And, you know, there were probably some things that I could say a little bit more authoritatively as a person who's non-white and evangelicalism that, you know, potentially they, they would not be able to to say as well. And so that was kind of the impetus for the project. And I was really excited to be able to write it with InterVarsity because of the history that InterVarsity has had with working with authors of color and the IVP specifically, but also InterVarsity at large. And, you know, I tell folks, you know, it was a hard project because you're navigating three strong personalities. We got along 99% of the time. We liked each other 100% of the time. And the moments where our ideas conflicted, we heard each other out. But by and large, you know, we try to write from a unified voice. And I think because we saw a lot of things the same way, the actual like, you know, pen to paper, the actual words just became a matter of like nuance and agreement. But the big idea is I felt like we we were from the same line of thought. Yeah, I really marveled at what feels like one voice, you know, in this book. I mean, you have your moments, all three of you, where you bring in your personal anecdotes Mm -hmm. and stories, but it's really Mm -hmm. delivered in this one consistent team voice, which I thought was pretty amazing uh, and not easy to accomplish. So I have to imagine that you must be certainly of one accord in your your thinking to be able to have done that. Was it the kind of thing where you all sat in a room together and literally wrote, or was it like a sign, like each of you took (laughs) different leads of different chapters, or how did you do it? Yeah, well, definitely not in the same room because we wrote it during the pandemic and most oh, of it during, uh, a lot of it during the lockdown. So it was a lot of, so essentially the, the process itself was we began with an outline and then we came up with three basic chapter summaries. And then we, based on like our 
kind of giftings, we assigned out who would write which one of the three chapters. And then we read each other's work and we edited and we also put it, we put input into every one of the chapters to make sure that it reflected our ideas and then also uh, a unified voice. And so a lot of that was, you know, I mean, Google Docs is amazing for, you know, some of the co-creative process. A lot of Zoom meetings, you can imagine, because of the pandemic and quarantine. And, you know, that was the kind of the technical writing process. Tell me a little bit about that interplay between what it meant to write on the topic you were writing about in the context sure. of the backdrop of what was happening in especially like 2020 and all the racial protests that were happening. I'm just curious to know if that influenced or had an impact in any way, shape, or form in your own thinking, or or did somehow the writing of the book, uh, was there any anything about that during this time period that yeah. was particularly meaningful or, or, or memorable? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and a part of it was we also did try to write the book so that it wasn't like so like focused on what was happening during the pandemic, although it was hard to ignore. You know, I think we mentioned COVID maybe once or twice in the book. So, Helen, I mean, the thing that stood out the most was when January 6th happened, the Capitol insurrection, because we had just submitted our first draft and we were editing our first draft. I remember sitting in my makeshift office at the time, texting Eric and Matt, you know, we're watching this live on, you know, cable news and we're just texting back and forth and we're like, what is happening? Like, I mean, like everybody else, like, and then when, when we saw the flags of, you know, Jesus saves and you see people, you know, on the perimeter praying and they're praying in the, in the chambers there, it was so disorienting. You know, the, the tagline of the book, and it was an iteration of something that I had suggested, you know, how Kingdom Marginalized Voices can help save uh, the American church. There is a part of me on January 6th, I'm like, I don't know there's much here to save. You know, I think there was a big part of the existential crisis where I was asking, all three of us, I think they would feel the same way. Like, what are we a part of, you know, both the American experiment and then also the American Christianity? And what it translated into was, I think, a conviction that what we were trying to write about was that, you know, there's a line in the book, you know, we don't know if God will save American Christianity or the American church, but that's not our greatest concern. You know, we're, our concern is um, that he will have his church and it will be built on the kingdom of God and not the Constitution of the United States. And it was a, it was a commitment to that. Like we had to ask ourselves, do we really believe what we're writing? And so there was a tenacity and there was a passion and conviction that went into the editing of the book that I think, you know, there wasn't, I think it presents itself probably a little bit more edgier is probably the wrong word, but the thoughts are a little bit more sharp coming out of that edit because of January 6th. So how would you answer the question, is the American church worth saving? Yeah. Uh, you put me on the spot. Is my funding at risk? <laughs> that, that may make a difference. No, I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> I was in New York City in May with a small group of people, and uh, Danielle Strickland was there. She's a church leader in Canada, and uh, she was leading us out of a passage from Acts chapter 27, and it just resonated so much with me. She was talking about Paul going to Rome, and there is, you know, they're taking the ship. And there's a line in uh, it's Acts 27, verse 22, and Paul is standing up to these people on the, the ship, and he is assuring them. He says, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. And it Danielle was saying there's this idea that like the people were, will survive even if the ship doesn't. <laughs> and that's my conviction is like the people that compose this construction called American Christianity, the American church, like Jesus will have his people, you know, he will have his family. The construct matters very little whether or not that moves on to the next generation or not. And I, I feel like that's where I'm at, you know, that doesn't. I think that makes me, in, in some ways, a better Christian, a better evangelical. 
I'm more committed to the kingdom. And we realize that our cultural expressions, what it means to follow Jesus, are less important than uh, what we will be when Jesus returns and makes all the wrongs right. So I didn't really answer your question directly, but I'll say it another way. Like, I am more comfortable with the ship sinking because I know that the people will survive. <laughs> it's interesting because on one hand, what I'm hearing you say is that we, as Christians, as American Christians, we have to be willing to release those aspects of American cultural captivity, right, that actually prevent us from really pursuing the kingdom. On the other hand, I feel like one of the strengths you bring both to the writing team and also what your book brings to the church is that it, it is bringing all these different other cultural lenses and ways to see the church and see Christianity, see Jesus. So tell me a little bit about how your own maybe particular cultural locations have had an impact on your writing and what you feel like you are uniquely able to bring you know, to the church through what you've written here. and, and, and Yeah. Then. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, has really been a part of, you know, kind of my particular vantage point as a second generation Hmong American is the understanding of what does it mean for the world, the nations to be here. So it, if I were a white Christian, if I were to say, you know, the nations, God is sending the nations here, why? Typically, the answer would be as a white Christian so that we could reach them. Right. So, and that's not a false statement. I think God is working through that. There's another perspective that immigrant communities bring to that question why is God sending the nations here? And this is just a matter of fact. Like, I'm not making a polemical argument. It's a matter of fact. You know, one in four immigrants that come to the United States are already Christian. Mainline Protestantism is in a membership decline, primarily because it stayed predominantly white. Evangelicalism is plateauing, slightly growing, depending on the year, depending on your, you know, your survey, your polls. And the reason why it is not free fall f declining is because of the immigrant Christians. And so if you were to ask the question again, why is God sending the nations here to America? Your white Christians would say so that we can reach them. You say to me, it's because we're here to preserve what God's done here in American Christianity and also so that we might actually reach you. And so I think there's there's kind of a full circle moment when we think about what does it mean to be somebody from a different part of the world to be a Christian here in America. Before we get back to our show, I want to let you know about the IVP book, Humble Confidence, a model for interfaith apologetics by Dr. Benno van den Toren and Dr. Kong San Tan. If you're someone who believes apologetics are as important as ever in today's cosmopolitan, multicultural, and multi-faith world, but you aren't quite sure how to relate the gospel to these ever-changing environments, this book is for you. Building on recent developments in apologetics and missiology, as well as on their experiences teaching internationally in Europe, Asia, and Africa, Dr. Van den Toren and Dr. Tan offer an approach that's conversational, patient, holistic, and embodied. So stay tuned until the end of the show to hear how you can get a special discount on Humble Confidence at ivypress.com. And now back to our conversation. You're listening to the Every Voice Now podcast, and I'm Helen Lee. Today, we're talking with Daniel Yang about his book, Inalienable, co-authored with Eric Costanto and Matthew Sorens. Daniel, you write a sentence in the book where you say, quote, you might be potentially contributing to the problems of the American church if you hide or downplay your heritage and your family's immigrant narrative, unquote. So I'm curious to know if you've ever experienced moments in the church where you felt a pressure to hide or downplay your own heritage and your own immigrant story. Every single day when I step outside of my door, <laughs> You know, we, we're all familiar with the, the idea of code switching, that there's a way that I live in my home and I'm, when I'm with Hmong people and, and other Asians that I get to be myself. And if I were to present that version, you know, and again, I, I recognize that even as a white person or as a black person, there are versions of this, right? You go into different spaces, you present different versions of yourself. Sometimes it's not because of your skin color, but it is because of which part of America you come from, those kinds of things. 
you know, if you're from the South, you might try not to have more of a Southern accent, you know, depending on the spaces that you're at. But, you know, specific question around my Asianness and my Mongness, absolutely, you know, I've been told by very important people in boardroom meetings, you know, don't do that Asian thing when you, and then fill in the blank. And that's happened on a few occasions. And there's that fear sometimes because of the reprimand that sometimes you get over time when you share too much of who you are or share too much from your perspective. Hey, that was rude when you said that from stage. Or, hey, you know, when Asians come into the space and if you say that and you do that, this is how we experience that. And if you do that enough times and you get reprimanded enough times, you begin to know your quote unquote place. And then you act a certain way to not be reprimanded. And when I say reprimanded, it doesn't mean like you're being disciplined like formally. It's just you, you know that you have less equity in that space if you continue to press in that certain way. So that's an everyday reality, but also knowing that if you were to act like your most authentic self, you would be least relevant to the conversations that are being had in a predominantly white space. That's a very real wear and tear, and it's one that I don't know how to resolve. You know, I think it's a minority majority dynamic. I think it's also a racial dynamic. It's a national ethnic dynamic. And so I think the importance of knowing who you are and caring for yourself is a part of saying, how do I persevere in these spaces so that I can benefit all of us? But everybody needs to know their limits and everybody needs to be able to, to know that at the end of the day, in order to be authentic to myself, I have to either remove myself from this space or I need to put some things into place so I can continue to be there in a healthy way. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry you've had to... I mean, that story you were telling about that kind of reaction from Christian boards, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean these are That's fellow right. believers who are saying these things, which is disturbing, <laughs> not surprising, but disturbing, which is part of the reason I, what I feel like you're doing in this book is you're trying to persuade the reader. Hopefully they are well persuaded by the end because you make a really wonderful case for why, you know, what will save the American church, right? It is welcoming voices from the margins, whether it's here domestically, whether it's globally. I mean, that is what you're proposing is, is being part of the solution anyway to some of these dynamics is to have that welcoming posture. I did want to ask you a little bit about how it's been in terms of the external response to your book. Now, of course, you you got a chance to talk about Inalienable at a high level with uh, some pretty well-known podcasts like The Holy Post has done a whole series, which has been great. I've really been enjoying that. So Tell me a little bit about what that's been like to try to, uh, did you predict, for example, that you would get the kind of response you've been getting? What's it been like? The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm always amazed when somebody says, hey, I read your book. Like that in itself is like, I'm amazed. So it's almost like whatever critique or compliment comes after that, I'm just like, thank you for giving it attention. <laughs> Matt and Eric have both written before. And so this is, I think, Matt's third book and Eric's second. So uh, maybe they're more used to that. For me, I'm kind of like, oh, that's kind of neat that I, you know, I've, I've written articles before. But so that's been kind of neat. You know, the positive, encouraging, responsive responses have probably been five to one. So they're the overwhelming majority. You know, I still I, I'll get messages, you know, maybe once a week from somebody that says, hey, this is the part of the book that really resonated with me. And so, you know, I appreciate the Amazon views. They're not just all family members. They're actually authentic readers that have read the book. So I appreciate all the comments that they've put out there. But I think for the, there are a few comments that I think people have made. One in particular was verbally given to me by an older gentleman. And I think what he was saying is correct. But I think we chose not to implement his ideas. And his thoughts were that, when you, and it was uh, in one of the chapters that I wrote, Decentering the White Church, that uh, he said, in sentiment, I agree with you, but in terminology and language, I think by being overly explicit, you turn off some people. You know, and I think he is probably correct. He's probably right. I think some will read our book and they will feel like they're being misunderstood or maybe even pushed to the margin themselves. And that's definitely not the intent. But I think that that's a reminder, number one, to get better as a communicator. But that's also a reminder that, number two, that there is a dynamic that comes from those who are used to being at the center, that if they're no longer at the center. And again, I'm not just referring to 
white Christians or to men, you know, I think majority groups, you can kind of create any kind of category. And when you're a majority group and you're no longer at the center, then, and I, I'm just re- reminded that like there is that lash that happens. And I think the ability to absorb that, to reflect it back to others in a positive way that they might see the need for change. I think that's been the post-writing. That's the post-writing project. And I feel like that's been a fruitful conversation as well. Some of those that initially sounded like critiques ended up being points of understanding. Well, as you reflect on those responses to the content that did make it into the final book, is there anything that comes to mind that you had to leave out that maybe we can look forward to reading about in the future? I don't know what Eric and Matt left out. Oh, I do to a certain degree, but what what did I leave out? I think there is, I have a suspicion, and these are things that I purposely omitted, probably because I, I want to write this at some point. I have a suspicion that when we think about minority people, and when we think about like specifically like immigrant communities, I mean, all, you know, Pew's come out with all this information, the U.S. census. We, we know in the next less than 20 years, uh, America will be no majority race. Whites will become less than half. There is something that immigrants, visible minorities, you know, so those who aren't white immigrants, but those like yourself and I, Helen, there's going to come a day where like ownership is going to click into our heads. And it may not be our generation. It may be our children. It may be our children's children. But like when we talk about like, what does it mean to be a national Christian? Someday people aren't going to have predominantly a white image in their head. That day's not here yet. 2022, it's still predominantly an image of a white person. At some point that's going to happen. And so some of us have done the work of like deconstructing American Christianity. We, we did some of that in our book, but we also try to put forth this idea that, you know, there's some things that are helping to save. There's some things that I think as a person who comes from an immigrant background that I want to proactively be about institutions that we need to build, things that alternatives that we need to provide that needs to be widely helpful to everybody. And so there's a reimagining ourselves outside of the immigrant narrative that many of us, maybe my children will have to, to have. Because I think for you know, and this is the this is the stereotype that for people that look like you and I, Helen, like we're the forever foreigner. Does it matter how? And maybe that's always going to be the case in America. But the day that it is no longer the case, like I want my I want my children, my descendants to be ready because Charlie Date said this, and I, I believe he's correct. He said, without the Holy Spirit, one day those who are marginalized and oppressed, without the Holy Spirit, when they come into power, they will marginalize and oppress. And for those of us who follow Jesus, believe in the fatherhood of God, we need to live empowered lives so that when we come into influence and power, we don't oppress and marginalize others. Amen to that. That's a great place, I think, for us to end with that word, with that excellent word. So I can't wait for that next book, Daniel, because that I will read cover to cover for certain and enjoy as much as I enjoy the first one. So I'm so proud that we published this book and and the message it has. The church needs it. So grateful for you, Daniel. Amen. Thanks for having me on. And now we want to let all of you know that you can visit ivypress.com to get your own copy of An Alienable, along with the other IVP resource mentioned in this episode. And use the code EVN40 to get 40% off plus free U.S. shipping on these books. That's code EVN40 at ivypress.com. So check out our site and discover more fabulous books and resources from IVP. Thanks everyone for listening to the Every Voice Now podcast brought to you by IVP. Our producers and hosts are Paloma Lee and Helen Lee. If you're enjoying our show, we would welcome your reviews and recommendations. You can also support our efforts financially at everyvoicenow.com. And we'd love to hear from you directly anytime. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Every Voice Now, or visit the site for show notes, transcripts, and more. And join us next time for another inspiring episode.